morning. It's not answered. I clicked answer, but it's not. Good but morning, everybody. Hi, guys. We have, we have Brian Crab in here. Well, good morning, everybody. We're back uh, for another duo of Tiny House Design and all of your questions answered from how to design a tiny house, how to do it within a budget, how to do it within your interest, and what is the most important topic of design. So shout out your questions. Uh, we're going to be taking turns answering some questions. And uh, Brian, you have a morning greeting? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Brian Crabb. Um, I'm a tiny home designer. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited to be back. Excited to be with my friend Tyson answering all of your questions. Uh, anything you want to know about tiny house design or, or tiny houses in general, uh, you know, text us, write them in at the thing, and we're just going to kind of go through and answer them one by one. Um, so, Tyson, if you want to take it away. Yeah, well, there's no questions so far. Um, but I background for tiny house design. Uh, I was one of the owners of tiny heirloom so we were the uh at least in our estimation uh the best tiny house builders with uh the most custom designs so it was a lot of fun to work there we had a lot of really crazy uh interests and clients and stuff like that so we were really pushed and then brian how i met him he came in uh, and saved us from ourselves design wise uh pretty early into the process and we worked together on a few collaborations, a few cool designs for some clients, and then, uh, yeah, we just kind of stayed in touch, and he's been yeah. keeping on while I went and did something else. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, all right, I've got, we've got a question. Jody Brown, when buying a used tiny house, how do you access the con or assess the condition of the trailer? Um, I'll answer that. So, basically, I mean, you just need to get under there and look. There'll be signs, because... Um, you know, the trailers should be coated with, a, you know, heavy duty paint. Um, and as long as the, unless somebody's painted over it, which would be fraud, I think. But as long as you don't see rust and, and there's nothing that's like bent or anything kind of crazy, um, you ought to be good. Otherwise, you know, you could hire somebody uh, to go out and really do a deep inspection. I think it's important to know how old the house is because again, you know, if, if, if the house is two years old and they've only moved it a couple times, unless there's something that gone terribly wrong with the house, you should be fine. Yeah. Um, here's another question uh, about wood frame versus metal. And then I'll also attack the uh, spray foam insulation. So the wood versus metal is kind of a tricky one. They're two completely different uh, beasts on their own, right? Wood's very conventional. Most people can frame wood. It is a little bit heavier than metal, so you can get away with a lot less weight. I think we were saying it was like 35% lighter, but it's such a pain in the butt to put together. If you can get, um, I don't remember the name of that company. Um, I'm sure Lindsay does, but if you can get that company that prints the, um, the metal framing for you, that's a really good way to go. Um, cause they can just print it, send it over with the instructions on how to put it all together. But even like fastening stuff to the metal, like from the inside doing, you know, drywall or paneling, you have to do, uh, metal screws and it's kind of a weird aesthetic where you have to do hangers, which is really tough. Uh, so I'd probably recommend wood and just build something on a, a more heavy duty trailer. And then, um, for the structural part of it, uh, wood's obviously really good. Metal can be better. Um, but the spray foam insulation, so we always did spray foam versus bat. Um, and the main reason is because it adds to the, uh, the structure. So once you spray the foam inside of the base, it expands inside of the base, which is just the, the portion in between the wood. And then uh, it creates a really tight fit for everything. And so the shear value um, of the, the structure goes way up because you have all of this very rigid insulation in there. And it's much better um, at keeping the transfer of heat as low as it can be. Yeah. Uh, and to go back on that too, uh, to talk about the wood frame, it's, you know, when you're trying to hang TVs and stuff like that, that's uh, fastening to the metal becomes kind of a nightmare. Um, and again, most builders know wood. And so like, they're going to be much more comfortable with it, which is going to give you a better quality product. Um, okay. I'm going to answer Liz Shimoski. Is there a disadvantage to a container home versus tiny house on wheels? So this question comes up a lot because people think that a container home is kind of just buy it and it's done. Honestly, 
in my experience, you're going to save money and get a better product by just building it out of wood. Um, because if you buy a container home, you're going to have to clean it. You're going to have to ensure that no hazardous materials were in it. Then you're going to have to cut it up, insulate it, put wood on the inside anyway. So by the time you're done with all of that, you basically could have just built it out of wood, put corrugated on it, and got the same kind of look for actually cheaper, and you can ensure uh, the rigidity. You know, you've got things like running electrical, running plumbing, all that needs to go inside the walls. And uh, another thing with, with container homes is that they have issues with breathing um, because, you know, they're not meant to be porous at all. So you run into mildew and mold problems. Um, you need to really vent them a lot. And now I will say, the, unless you're doing like a three prong container home and you need the rigidity to do some kind of cantilever, in my humble opinion, it is not worth it to go the route of buying a container to turn into a home. Yeah, there are a couple of companies who um, who do that sort of thing, and what they do for the uh, for the mold is they have like an air transfer system where they blow in just a ton of air, blow out a ton of air. It's all very uh, locked up when all the doors are closed, stuff like that. And then, um, but you know, to Brian's point, it's very expensive to do it to start with something metal and then essentially turn it into something wood on the uh, an expensive and necessary process. Um, I've seen people do some really cool stuff with the container homes, but I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that said it was totally worth it and the uh, uh, hassle that was that they were happy to have. Um, there was another question about like underbelly and how to keep uh, critters from getting inside your tiny home. Uh, we used to spray foam the undersides. Uh, it gets a little bit tricky if you ever need to do maintenance or anything like that. Um, there's, a, there's like a hard pan that you can put under the, the trailer that keeps things from getting in there. Again, that's tricky with maintenance. They have the soft uh, sort of cloth lines that you can take off and then you can access for maintenance, but um, anything can chew right through that. So the best possible thing is just to fill it with, uh, with spray foam and build it right so that you never have to deal with maintenance. It also keeps all of your pipes more insulated, um, reduces the event that you're gonna have frozen pipes or anything burst or anything like that. So it's kind of a good all around way to go. Um, a good size for your first tiny home for a couple, Brian? Uh, I think that the 24 foot is is a nice size for a couple. Brian, I was going to say 24 foot. You were going to say uh, 24 is is. I was going to say class, that. I think you just you took the word right out of my mouth. Oh my gosh, twinsies! This is just the greatest time. Oh, uh, 24 feet is nice. It's good. It still feels more mobile once you get up to like the 28s and the 30 and 32s. It's a it's a beast to move, um, and you could get away with like an 18, and, but that's very very small. 24 for two people, you're not going to be on top of each other. It's going to feel like a full house. You're going to get a nice kitchen, a nice bathroom, a nice living room, and a nice uh, bedroom area. Now, when you start adding children, of course, you need to grow bigger or just keep them outside on a chain, whichever you prefer. But for two people, 24 foot is, is uh, my, my gold standard. Yeah, if you like small spaces, keep your children outside on a chain. You get <laughs> plenty of small spaces after that. Um, yeah, 24 feet. That's a really cool size. We've, uh, in fact, the probably the majority of homes that we've designed were 24 feet. The tricky thing is the weight with 24 feet. So you want to pack everything that you can into it. Most people, um, try and get away with a double axle and most tiny house trailers, unless it's changed in the last couple of years, um, are 6k axles, meaning you have about 12,000 pounds you can put. Uh, on top of the axles, including the trailer chassis. Um, but we always went with a uh, triple axle. You just get a lot more bang for your buck. It's probably an extra thousand something dollars to put them on there, but you don't have to stress out about weight. And then when you go to move the thing, um, it's just a lot less uh, of an anxiety piece to uh, move something with, with three axles because you don't worry that they're going to snap or something like that. Right. And to, and to, and to go on to that, it's important when if you're designing a tiny home or thinking about laying out your tiny home that a lot of the weight is on the tongue side um, between the tongue and the and the axles. If if you have like your bathroom and all your weight on the rear end of the the, the house, it's going to bring the back end of your vehicle up and it's going to cause a lot of issues with weighing. So 
the sweet spot, say for your bathroom, if you had to choose a side, you want it to be on the axle side. I mean, on the uh, the tongue side, and that way the weight is pushed down on it. But again, you want to kind of think about spreading the weight out between the tongue and the front axle. Um, okay. Can you? Yeah, for sure. If uh, you're um, if you're designing something else by yourself. Uh, it's always good to at least run the design by somebody else too, because like Brian said, there's so so much tricky stuff with weight distribution. Because even if you know your trailer's not just completely uh, tilting onto the ground, you know when you go to tow it, you don't want it to fishtail, you don't want it to break the, uh, the axles on your truck or something like that. So at least you know run it by somebody. I doubt they'll charge you any money for it, but you know you want to make sure that most of the weight is over the axles um, as much as you possibly can. And then if you do have to put weight on either side of them, just make sure it's balanced. You know, it's not rocket science for sure, but also not something you want to mess up because you can't really go back and fix it. Right, right. Um, all right, to answer David Rotter, is 10 foot wide becoming more popular these days? I don't know that it's becoming more popular, um, especially because to make it 10 foot wide means that you're going to have to have wide load special permitting to tow. You might have to have a lead vehicle. It becomes a lot more of an issue to move it. Um, but that being said, you know, if, if somebody wants to design a home and that they know they're not going to move anywhere but on their property, then 10 foot is a nice option because that extra two feet feels like a million miles, honestly, in a tiny home. Um, when you're dealing with such small space, you know, every foot really, you, it really feels huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the max width is technically, uh, eight and a half feet. I don't know what the absolute max is that you can go on the freeway, but you know, like Brian was saying, I know that anything over, um, eight and a half anything eight feet, you're going to have to get a permit for sometimes. It's not super hard. You just need like a follow car. Sometimes you just need a permit or a wide load. Um, it just depends on where you are. But anything I've heard west of the Mississippi is a lot easier than going east. Right. Um, and Lisa, I am not with Tiny Heirloom anymore. We actually sold the company a couple of years back. Um, and then Jason and Zach continued doing uh, tinyhouse.com. And uh, I often did something else a lot less exciting. Um, all right, I'm going to answer Gwen's thing for a first year. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Brian, we doubled up. I know. I'm sorry. I thought you were – all right, go answer your – you do yours first, and then I'll do mine. I'm going to answer about the Murphy bed. Okay. Um, a good length for the first floor bedroom, tiny house. Um, usually eight feet is uh, what I would usually do. That's, that's again, you know, why I like the 24-foot um, – models because everything's broken up into eight foot sections or just, you know, slightly less than eight foot walls and stuff like that. But, you know, you can typically get a uh, seven foot bathroom, seven foot bedroom, seven foot living space and kitchen, you know, something like that um, on the main floor. But typically if you try and make the bedroom too big, um, it's either going to be, you know, the centerpiece of the home or uh, it's just going to feel like wasted space. So the, you know, obviously, it's kind of a, a balance, right? Trying to get everything that you can into your tiny house while um, trying to enjoy yourself while you're living in there. But you know, when we were designing, we would start with the the concept of um, uh, of what your must haves are. So you know, figuring out you know, does somebody like to cook, right? If they like to cook and if they want a big kitchen, uh, if they want to entertain people, you know, those things are kind of the the center point of the design. So purpose for your tiny house is going to be. Um, the, the biggest product that you're going to be putting in there. So, you know, whatever that is, you want to make sure and build around that instead of saving it for the last uh, portion of the design. So, if, you know, having a bedroom that you're going to be spending a lot of time in is a big priority. Make it as big as you want. Yeah, same, exactly. And that's the, that's the thing to think about with your tiny homes, right, is, is exactly that. What do you need the house to accomplish? Right? What do you need, you know, some people must have a tub. Some people don't care about a tub. So that, that, affects the design from start to finish. And it's important, even if you're just starting to think about going tiny, to sit down and really think about what you love the most about your house, what you don't use in your house. You know, there's no point in, in having a dining room if you don't use it. Um, and, and going tiny is just that. It's really just being as efficient as possible in your life and what you need from your home to accomplish. Um, okay, so to go back to... Gwenzy, can you build a sleeping loft over a Murphy bed? Is there enough headroom? 
Yes, Gwen, there is, especially because they make uh, what's like a, it's a side Murphy. So instead of it being instead of it being like this, right, and then coming down, it's actually like this, and then it comes down. So in that case, you could get a queen um, or bigger, or even a king. Actually, you could get a king because the king is six foot wide and eighty inches long. So. Generally, we like to frame under the lofts at like 75 inches, which is six foot three. Um, but you can, and that leaves you about three foot of headroom to the peak. Um, but you can choose whatever height you, you want. And again, that, that will be kind of uh, predicated by what you need to do in the loft. But the answer is yes, you can build a loft over a Murphy bed. Sorry, I got the hiccups. Um, yeah, we've built uh, quite a few lofts over Murphy beds, and like Brian was saying, we just went with the landscape um, landscape ones. They have them on uh, like Wayfair; you can get them pretty cheap. They're like five hundred bucks. You can get more of a um, a purposeful one where you know when you fold it up, it's like a desk or a shelf or something like that, a counterbalance, so that uh, you know it's really easy to use and nothing falls off of your shelves. But um, you know, kind of going back to that point of you know purpose for your tiny home, having as many spaces uh, dual is great too so you know like brian was saying if you don't really need a dining room then you know why build one um you know another point to that is if you don't use it a ton just build one that can be taken away you know whenever you need it so we built uh you know bar tables that you can fold down or we built um you know tables that can be folded up and put away or tucked into the wall or under the stairs or whatever it is so you know having a little bit of ingenuity in the design is really cool too brian's really good at that kind of stuff um, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, shows where they do really interesting things, but, you know, being smart about um, what space can be used twice. We used to say, uh, space so nice, got to use it twice. Only I said that. And nobody ever really laughed, only like a quarter of the time, but it feels yeah. good to see you laughing. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, pity, it's a pity laugh, but, I'm, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> um have you ever built a wheelchair-friendly tiny home? Uh, yeah, we did, actually. So doing anything ADA in a tiny home is pretty tough, right? Because you, I think it's three and a half feet for a wheelchair to spin, which is what you have to, what you have to accomplish. Um, and doing that inside of a tiny house is really crazy. So if you have eight and a half foot wide, you know, you're going to be about seven and a half or less uh, feet wide on the actual interior space. If you have cabinets in there, that's another, you know, two feet. So your space gets really tight really quick. I'd probably recommend doing some sort of a park model, you know, 10 to 12 foot wide, something like that. Um, it's a tricky thing to design around, but people do it. It's not impossible. You just kind of lose a little bit of function. Right. And then another thing to remember too, um, is, you know, when you park it, so the, the floor, of the subfloor of a tiny house is usually about 24 to 25 inches above the ground. ADA regulations require that for every one inch that you go up, you go over one foot. So that means you need 24 to 25 foot of ramp uh, to get into the house. Now I know if you, with, with the wheelchair, you can get it at a higher, at a steeper angle. Um, but if you were designing for specifically for people in wheelchairs to get it permitted and all that, you would have to think about having that long of a ramp. Um, all right, Ryan, Lecky, any recommendations on how to get started in tiny home building? I'm with a company that has a ton of skilled laborers and a very large warehouse space and considering tiny homes as a means of diversification. Um, personally, I learned the most about building tiny homes by kind of going in and watching people do it. Um, another option is to kind of just jump in, but you need to do a lot of research because it's important that the framework is strapped correctly and that, you know, your, that your base is proper. The rest of it is kind of just home building 101. Um, you want to increase the rigidity as much as possible, but really attaching it to the base and attaching the roof system on is super important. And, and you should do a lot of research on that. Um, because if you're dragging it down the road, think about, you know, that's 70 plus mile per hour winds that are hitting that roof, um, which is not, you know, not typical for a house. So it's hurricane straps, you bolt to the frame. There's a lot of plumbing work that goes into the frame before you put on the subfloor. But once you get that stuff figured out, and I think probably, you know, the first thing, the first one you do is always going to suck with everything in everything in life. The first one you do stinks. It's always awful. But the second one gets better. And the third one, and by the time you do your 150th one, you're going to have it figured out. 
Uh, Tyson and the guys barely figured it out before they got before they left. <laughs> uh, I think it only took like 150 houses for them. But it's just yeah. just just go out and do it and really spend weeks, man, like researching. People write about their experiences with building their tiny homes, and so there's luckily we live in a day and age where like you you just type into Google like you know tiny home build questions, tiny home uh, pra- best practices, whatever. Um, and also, you know, reach out to uh, to the people that, that you respect, like like Tyson and, and Zach and Jason, who, you know, had a, an amazing company doing tiny homes. And, and a lot of the builders that you're going to be talking to uh, today and tomorrow, like, you know, everyone's really ha- happy to help. So, uh, you know, use those resources. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's a little bit daunting building your own tiny house, for sure. Um, but like Brian said, there's a ton of resources out there and a ton of people who are just willing to vomit their experience and uh, education all over you in a, in a good way, right? People are really willing to, um, you know, talk to you about all the pros and cons of doing it. And then, um, you know, you can pretty much call any builder too and ask really technical questions and nobody's going to really turn you down unless they're just big jerk log. Uh, Karen had a cool question about the pros and cons of lifting the kitchen floor and storing the bed underneath. That's a super tricky one. So we've done that before on a couple of occasions. Uh, we, we did a pull-out bed on one, and then I think we just did some like underneath storage uh, on another one. It's a really cool way to do it, so for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, you can get all of your electrical to run to the platform really easily, uh, which is really nice, you know, for doing plumbing electrical. Because in a tiny house, you know, you're you're so cramped for space inside of the walls, and then you know you have to your drain has to be able to slope. I think it's a quarter inch per foot um, on level ground in order for it to go out. So you know the the height that you're dealing with already is so tight. So you have to you know really think about where your outlets about where your water outlet the outside is going to be. So having a little bit of height makes it really easy. And then also the options for um, what you can put under it are great. But the trick is um, you have to make it structural, right? So if you're going to have a big hollow underside with a bed that pulls out, you have to at least do uh, two by six framing uh, really tightly spaced, like 12 inches apart, something like that, or two by eight, which means that you're taking a lot of head height out of the kitchen. So, you know, again, just kind of goes back to if you know what you're doing, Fantastic. Draw up some plans. If you don't, don't attempt to do something like that without talking to somebody who's been there, done that. Um, all right. Let me see. Cross. Catwalk. Uh, all right. I'm going to talk, uh, Emil. How about maintenance in long term? Do you have clients that want some renovation work after some years exposed to the elements? How could how long could the wood of the walls last? So basically, you know, a tiny home is built like a regular home for all intents and purposes. You use structural lumber, two by four, just like a regular home would use. You use, um, you know, the zip system or, or sheathing on the outside, just like a regular home would use. Every single thing about it is just like a normal home. So you can expect a tiny home to last for the manufacturer's lifetime guarantee, which I think is 20, 25 years. However, um, if you drag your tiny home around, you know, th- five times a year or something, of course, that's going to add to wear and tear just by moving it. But if you were to park that thing and put it on blocks and like and have it like a regular home, there's no there's no reason that it shouldn't last just as long as a normal home. Um, and renovating would be the exact same way. There's nothing super crazy. I mean, that's the whole point about tiny homes is that you get the quality of a normal home with the mobility of a trailer, whereas manufactured homes were super thin aluminum, they were poorly made, uh, and that's why people kind of moved away into the tiny home community. So uh, again, renovating is, is the same as doing it in a regular home, and you can expect it to last as long. So Nino and Victoria have been very uh, persistent about SIPs. I actually don't know much about SIPs. Um, I have had a little bit of experience with it. That's um, uh, what structurally insulated panels. Right? Do you know anything about that, Bry? Yeah. So uh, I, I just called you Bry. That's a new level of friendship for us. Oh, I've done a couple houses using SIPs, um, but they're foundation homes. Um, and so basically what they do is they run everything in, they, they basically pre-make the house in a, in a warehouse, uh, based on the designs and then it goes to site and it bolts together. So you've got conduit already in it. You've got plumbing in it already. Um, and then they're insulated. Most of them that I've seen are two by six. 
uh, with three quarter inch ply on either side. So, and then spray foamed inside and they're very, very heavy. Um, they're very heavy. And again, you know, framing a two by six and then when having the three quarter ply, three quarter ply, you end up losing about a half a foot uh, on the interior using them and you add a lot of weight. I don't know what the reason, what, what the best possible use for using sips on a tiny home on wheels would be seeing as uh, you don't need that level. You get that level of rigidity with spray foam and there's no kind of cantilever. You know, the roof system is, is only eight foot wide. So sip will get you to like 16 to 20 foot spans for ceiling, which is awesome in a house, but you don't get that. You don't have that problem in a tiny home. So yes, they can be used. Um, and maybe somebody out there wants to specialize in it, but I just think it, it ends up causing a little bit more problem than it solves. Yeah, I think there's also kind of this myth about SIPs being super easy to install, like little pieces of a puzzle that you just put together or something like that. It's not necessarily the case, right? There's a lot of really technical aspects that need to go into it. I'd always be worried about not connecting the electrical or not connecting the you know pipes or something really well on the inside because once you get in there, um, taking apart SIPs kind of defeats the purpose, right? Because they're constructed to be put together and uh, you don't really want to go digging in there. Um, there's another question from uh, Cinda nice. about um, about the cost of tiny homes. So this is kind of a tricky discussion, right? And kind of an age old question um, ever since people went from the, the grassroots of tiny homes being without plumbing and electricity to something that you could actually live in and enjoy um, in a more conventional sense. Um, and so the price, you know, the, the thing to think about with tiny homes is that you have all of the hard costs of an actual house without any of the soft costs. So if you think about, um, you know, a 1500 square foot house, you have a lot of what we would call empty space on the inside, right? Which is just floor and then roof above. So it's just space inside of your house, you know, to put a couch or whatever it is inside of a tiny house. Every square foot is actually really expensive because you have a lot of stuff that goes into that square foot. You don't just have a lot of empty space. You only have about 120 to 150 square feet. And most of it is going to have, you know, electrical plumbing cabinets, um, you know, windows, doors, you know, something like that in it. And so, um, you know, it's not cheap to build square feet to build any other thing is you also have to build it for, um, uh, you know, for being on the road, right? So being on the road is like being inside of a, a, an earthquake when you're taking your home down the road. And so you have to build, um, you know, hurricane straps, you have to um, tie it down. Uh, um, there's just a lot of costs that are involved that, aren't inside of a regular house and then vice versa. But, you know, the the whole idea um, of what you pay per square foot is so relative too, right? Because, um, you know, like I said, when it's a smaller square foot, you have to be able to pay for all the materials. Right. And to answer onto that too, you know, the, the hundred dollars a square foot, which is, is I haven't seen in a very long time, except in like somebody's making a, you know, a, a subdivision, it's generally between two and four hundred dollars a square foot for custom build. And two hundred is builder grade material, so it's drywall, it's home depot counters, it's you know, cruddy countertops, it's flimsy doors. Whereas most people in their tiny homes they want like a ship lap or they want a tongue and groove. And if you were to translate that to a normal home, the cost per square foot goes exponentially higher. You want like a nice tile for the floor. You want your flooring system to be nice. That all costs an insane amount. When they are charging a hundred to two hundred dollars a square foot, you know, they're putting in ninety nine cents a square foot flooring. The tile is seventy nine cents a square foot. Um, you know, you're not getting anything really great. It's all builder grade and it's all meant, you know, it, it just but by Tiny homes in in general want to be nicer and have higher quality materials and, and you know that that costs money. Well, well what's up guys? We couldn't really hear if you had to hop on. You <laughs> we're stealing a little bit of your session, but uh, a couple of our favorite people here. So we had to jump on and say hi to you guys and uh, wanted to just say you guys did an amazing job. Literally people are saying this is solid gold, so Wow, nice thing I've heard all day. Thank you. <laughs> and the morning is just getting. What about the things I said to you here. before we started? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, that. so real quick before we finish, yeah. uh, it was good talking to all you guys. Brian uh, and his girl just had a baby. Here's a Woo! picture of it. Nice. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. If that's not not the best thing you've seen all day, uh, you have a pretty good life. Thank you. Love it. Congrats, Brian. Good Congrats, stuff, Brian. Dude. Well, we love you guys. Thank you uh, for your questions. Thanks for your time. It was good uh, catching up with some of you guys. Yeah, we love you guys too. And uh, don't forget to check out Brian's session a little bit later today too. He'll be speaking again. So, whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, so All right, bye, guys. Brothers, yeah, good to see you, Brian. Really appreciate it. All right, bye.